Fusion, the international science radio show. We have a bouncer on the doors of perception. <laughs> the good, the bad, the ugly. It gets pretty exciting. The myths, the truths. <sighs> Astro seismology, magnetism, the dark side, genetically engineered potatoes, planetoid, planetoid. I love that word. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to Diffusion. Sit back and relax while we engineer weird and wonderful science directly into your imagination. I'm Ian Wolfe. On this edition, Jaden Hastings talks about science, art and the first home genetic engineering lab registered with the Australian Office of Gene Technology Regulation. First up, the Australian federal election may be decided on electric cars. Electric cars are the new NBN. It's a war on the weekend. The Prime Minister Scott Morrison has attacked the opposition Labour Party leader Bill Shorten for planning to ensure 50% of car sales in Australia by 2030 will be electric cars. As opposed to the Liberal National Coalition Government's plan of 50% of car sales in Australia to be electric cars by 2030. The only difference in policy is that Labor proposed a pollution emissions standard and the government didn't. Here's the Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Bill Shorten wants to corral Australians into, as part of his plan, is out of the sort of lifestyles that are supported by the vehicles they're currently buying. And a reply from opposition leader Bill Shorten. That doesn't mean we're going to confiscate someone's ute in 2030. It doesn't mean that. (laughs) It's a federal election year. The Prime Minister has further complained that people who drive electric cars don't pay fuel tax, at the same time as announcing $430 billion in tax cuts. Here's Bill Shorten on KISS FM being asked about how fast cars can be recharged on the car charging network that Labor proposes. We're going to outline a network on the national highway of charging stations just so that you can you know, travel around Australia. and. How long does it take to charge it up? Uh, it can take, it depends how what the original charge is, but it can take eight to ten minutes depending on your charge. It can oh, take that, longer. Oh. Dep- well, it depends how flat your battery is. Yeah. Right. The Prime Minister, the Treasurer and Energy Minister and all of the Murdoch and Fairfax media, newspaper, radio and TV attacked Bill Shorten for saying this, insisting... Everybody knows it would be no less than eight hours to charge an electric car. What they failed to mention was that Bill Shorten was using the Treasurer's own blog and press releases as a source of the charging time on an ultra-fast car charging network. In October 2018, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg announced that the government would fund an ultra-fast electric car charging network around Australia that would allow a car to drive for 200 kilometres range for just eight minutes of charging. Labor has the identical policy. In an article in the Sydney Morning Herald in 2018, Treasurer Frydenberg assured people that the national power grid can handle the extra 2% of demand from electric cars by 2030. In 2012, the Australian federal election was fought over switching Australia over from ancient corroding twisted pair copper phone lines to 21st century optic fibre broadband. A simple engineering issue became politicised, with the Labor Party planning for a world's best practice fully fibre network and the Liberal National Coalition Party promising a hybrid coax cable fibre satellite twisted pair tin can and string solution. The Liberal National Party coalition won power and have built the national broadband network over the last six years, with unreliable speeds too slow to be labelled broadband outside Australia. As a result, the internet still goes wrong when it rains. The Liberal National Coalition Party's cheaper and faster solution is $20 billion over budget and late. I hope electric cars don't suffer the same fate. (music) 
You're listening to Ian Wolfe on Diffusion Science Radio. Send emails to science at diffusionradio.com. We're brought to you across Australia on the Community Radio Network and podcast over the internet on www.diffusionradio.com. Home genetic engineering that blurs the line between science and art. Jaden J. Hastings is an artist, scientist and biohacker with three master's degrees, travelling around the world doing different artist residencies. I spoke with her over Skype and began by asking her what does it mean to have a home synthetic biology laboratory in her garage, rated to PC1 by the Office of Gene Technology Regulation. Well, it's very exciting, first of all, because it's the very first private home base to be granted PC1 certification. So for those that might not be familiar with that term, PC1 means containment level one, which has particularly to do with GM dealings or genetically modified organisms. For much of the rest of the world, GMO research is, is falls under the purview of regular biosafety level one containment, sometimes biosafety level two. In Australia and New Zealand, we're really concerned with the impact of GM research on our environment. So we pay particular attention to containment, so proper storage and disposal, as well as reporting of any production of genetically modified organisms. So even at the very basic level of modifying bacteria and yeast, they are considered low to no risk within the research scope of laboratories maybe you'd see in university, in academia, for education as well. So I've been working with the OGTR to determine how to make very fundamental research in genetic engineering and synthetic biology, a field that worldwide will continue to have enormous impact in multiple fields uh, for materials research, food security, and any number of other scientific fields. So for me, this is an important step to figure out how to open up the field of synthetic biology to not just academia and large industry, but rather make the technology more widely available in a way that meets our stringent criteria for containment. And what sort of changes did you have to make? So containment pays particular attention to disposal. Disposal of genetically modified organisms that I've produced in in the lab space. So first of all, before I do any GM work, I have to get my projects approved by a biosafety committee. So I'm not doing my work completely independent. There is oversight into what I do, which is very important because it gives me an opportunity to, to have someone else consider the rigor of what I'm trying to do in the lab. So am I producing a GM organism or doing a particular action in the lab that is safe to me and to the environment? And ask very important questions about whether or not it's the best approach. So it's a way of just getting peer review on the level of biosafety before I even start out a project. And what sort of projects are you doing? Well, at the moment, we're working on setting up the IBC so that I can be properly approved for specific projects. So in my home lab, I have not yet started that work. That's all just recently happened this year in 2019. My application was filed in 2018, and I've been working intensively with the OGTR, with the leadership there, to not only ensure that I meet all of the criteria, which includes showing that I've got a risk assessment in place in case of accidents like spilling, that I have thoroughly tested my disposal procedure. So if I create a GM, I have to be able to prove to show that I'm able to kill off any of that GM and properly dispose of it as any lab would be expected to. And then I need to have proper oversight with an IBC. So I'm working with a number of leaders in biosafety across Australia to not only sort of set the standard for other spaces like mine that might emerge in the future, but also help them shape the policy. So it's really open and easily accessible for the entire public, but particularly for educators across Australia. Do you think we'll end up with high schools with these sort of labs? Oh, I would hope so. I really would hope so. And I will do everything that I can to uh, work with any 
state, federal leadership, personal educators, educators across Australia and secondary and tertiary to make synthetic biology at every level accessible and easy to translate into those spaces. And how would you explain what synthetic biology is to people? Synthetic biology builds on the long history of genetic engineering. We've been genetically engineering to different degrees for millennia. We've just become really effective now at controlling on a gene by gene basis, either introducing new genes to existing species or modifying existing genes within the species to make them better at resisting heat or insect pests and increasing nutritive value or making them just simply better or yielding uh, larger, better crops. So now with synthetic biology, we're getting to a point where we can completely control the circuit, the regulatory circuit that can overexpress a particular material. So this is becoming really valuable to an area of research that I work in a lot, which is material science to produce, mass produce, not through growing crops or raising cattle, but rather through inserting a very specific gene and overexpressing it, brewing it or fermenting it in bacteria and yeast, growing a specific material. So there are companies out there like Bolt Threads that overexpress silk, spider silk in yeast and are able to mass produce this beautiful, elegant, strong spider silk that are used now in fashion houses like Stella McCartney's. So synthetic biology has wonderful promise for making our manufacturing and bioproduction so much more efficient and more effective and with a much better impact on our, our environment. Synthetic biology holds significant promise in multiple sectors, particularly in making our impact on the earth a bit lighter. It reduces the amount of resources that we required to produce to biomanufacture materials. For example, Bolt Threads is able to mass produce silk simply using fermentation, using yeast. So it's taken spider silk and introduced it into yeast and those yeast overexpress spider silk. So rather than requiring a massive amount of spiders to produce those same fibers, they're able to simply use fermentation, a process that we use in brewing our beer or producing wine or other spirits. Synthetic biology is very useful for multiple reasons. It's fast, it's more efficient than other traditional manufacturing processes for biological materials, and it's a lot more flexible. Synthetic biology allows us to also uh, leverage informatics uh, so that we can start designing materials de novo simply using generative design or other machine learning approaches. So there's quite a bit of opportunity in synthetic biology as a field as well as our future for biomanufacturing. I did see one of the bolt threads spider silk tires just the other night. Yes, they're gorgeous. They've been working on collaborating with other designers like Stella McCartney to show the possibilities of working with fermented or or biomanufactured materials. And you've been working on biohacking or synthetic biology projects for a while before you started setting up your own lab. And you're an artist working on many things. Yes. To me, whether I'm working as an artist or scientist is uh, rather, say, irrelevant, but that's not really, I'm not starting any project or idea with science or art in mind, per se. I'm interested in a particular challenge. And it just so happens that sometimes scientists find one particular aspect of what I do interesting, perhaps as a novel material or as an opportunity to expand it out into another problem. And sometimes the arts community will find what I do intriguing because it raises particular social or ethical problems or even legal. Sometimes I'll stumble into a legal gray area that has not yet been parsed. For example, using one's own biomaterial or doing self-experimentation. 
this is a gray area for the general public. There's an aversion to self-experimentation in academia because it poses a threat to the individual, as in one might be accepting a bit more risk for the sake of their research than they might if they were asking someone else to do the same task. Now, that, that poses an ethical problem because they might be putting themselves at unnecessary risk. Whereas someone in the general public that might, say, be experimenting with themselves for aesthetic reasons might be willing to take higher risk because there is just simply personal interest at stake as opposed to someone else's interests or commercial benefit. So sometimes when I'm working with my own bodily materials or with self-experimentation, it falls under the purview of ethical research or legal research because we need to understand why we put particular constraints on self-experimentation in academia where there is a power disparity versus where self-experimentation and bodily autonomy might need to be better secured for the public where there, that power disparity does not necessarily exist, or why we might need to advocate on behalf of individuals that want to do self-experimentation, even in cases of sort of end-of-life decisions. So as an artist, when I face the arts community, there are usually different questions of what I do versus when I'm speaking with scientists or even lawyers about my practice. So it's all myself, it's all centered within my body and my lab and my practice, but I find that however I need to define myself depends on who my audience is at the time. Whether the question is being asked of someone that is situated in a particular discipline. So you've looked at your own genes, I believe? I have. I've had my whole genome sequenced for a few years now. And you were doing a project years ago on looking at uniquely human genes, I believe. I was, yeah. That was one of my very first projects as an artist or as someone who's publicly examining what it means to be materially human as opposed to any other being on Earth. I've since had my whole genome sequenced. So the full 6 billion bases, and, and that's to complement data that I had much earlier done with 23andMe, I believe that was 2007, uh, 2008, sometime very, very long ago, I had the 23andMe SNP array performed. This new sequence data is my entire genome. So everything that should be found within the cells, the DNA within the cells of my body. And what are you doing with that information? Any number of things, actually. I'm, 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 I'm interested in looking at what that information can and can't tell me. I'm also interested in what I feel comfortable disclosing and to whom. So I work with colleagues in law to examine notions of privacy around the genome, what we should and shouldn't feel comfortable sharing and to whom. This also emerges in my, in my arts practice. One of my recent artworks, The Demiurge, is, in, involves machine learning. So in The Demiurge, I have formulated an algorithm to uh, train on all publicly available data that associates a particular mutation with a disease and the magnitude of that association or the risk associated with that particular mutation. And then once it's developed that model of disease, it, that association between particular mutations and disease, the machine, I then give it an opportunity to look through my whole genome and tell me what it thinks I should change in my genome. So parts of my genome that might be particularly risky. But the aim of this was for a commission work for an exhibition called Perfection that challenged our preconceived notions of health and what it means to have a perfect genome. So the question was, if a machine, the demiurge in this case, gave me instructions, which it did, it, it identified particularly harmful mutations in my genome and then generated its own list for me of those particular uh, genes and even generated gRNA sequences to give to CRISPR so that I could actually go in and act upon that information and modify my genome if I so chose, would I act on that information? Would I 
believe or or would I consider that information reasonable to act upon and actually modify my genome so that my my body might be quote more perfect at the genomic level. So that's got all sorts of potential for diagnosis as well, I guess. It is, but the interesting questions that emerge around the ethics of modifying the somatic cells, the bodily cells, the differentiated cells in our body, would modifying those particular genes that seem to be associated with disease also mean that I'm losing capacity of personality? We don't yet have any understanding of the influence or association of particular genes with personality, with creativity or or other much more socially constructed uh, notions of phenotype. So we have very particular and limited understanding of association of genes to particular phenotypes that are associated mostly with disease, but we don't yet understand how our genome shapes our personality and and how we present ourselves to the world as individuals, as as a holistic individual. So if you were to perfect your genome, you could lose your identity. Well, it might shift my identity a bit, and we have no idea how. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, you're working across a huge number of disciplines. Right. Well, I'm, I believe in being disciplinarily agnostic. I, I don't really believe that I need to necessarily fulfill my outputs or or what I do towards a particular discipline, because there's so much meaning that can be found in any regard, depending on on who I'm speaking to, right? So the fact that I'm editing my genome could have impact in so many different vectors. It's, It's a multivariate issue. It's a multivariate action. So trying to to limit what I might be doing to one discipline just seems, it seems so, so limiting in so many regards. Yes, I can understand that. You're talking about machine learning there. So what other yeah. things have you been using machine learning for recently? I am moving towards developing collaborative practices with machines. So really leveraging the way that machines look at the information that we provide them and perhaps allowing them to generate their own notions of biology. So watching, I like watching machines learn and seeing what novel ideas might emerge from allowing them to train themselves. So I'm really interested in the prospects of machine learning as it uh, relates to synthetic biology. So I'm particularly interested in the application of machine learning to the automation of biodesign of applying machine learning into the field of synthetic biology and what new forms of materials and biological forms, including artificial life, we might see emerge as we provide further data to to machines to train upon. So you also have an interest in space. I do indeed. Last July, I had the privilege of serving on the crew of six for a lunar simulation in Poland, where we spent 15 days in isolation both testing existing technology, but also examining the prospects of the future direction of of space exploration. This last July also coincided with the initialization of the Australian Space Agency. So really excited to see how this can bring in disparate fields or seemingly disparate fields of synthetic biology into the space sector. I've been working quite a bit with colleagues overseas on in situ resource utilization. So taking whatever resources might be found locally or just around the space space, the habitat, in order to biomanufacture whatever is needed for the crew in, in that space. Australia is an incredible place and presents so many opportunities for the space sector in that we have wonderful terrestrial analogs, both materially as well as sort of spatially, to off Earth environments. So I'm really hoping that we can extend all of this research into synthetic biology towards the this emerging space sector to produce novel materials and 
aid in in situ resource utilization research here locally in Australia. I'll also mention last year there was an important report that came out, ACOLA, A-C-O-L-A, and that was investigating uh, the prospects for synthetic biology here in Australia, looking forward towards 2030. And the uh, new genome foundry that is now being built through CSIRO, there's a lot of exciting science that is emerging here in Australia, a lot of wonderful government-backed initiatives that are now finding support. So I'm really excited to see how these thus far kind of siloed fields of synthetic biology can now serve the emergent, emerging space sector here in Australia. Well, Jaden Hastings, thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. That was Jaden Hastings talking about her art and science and the authorised synthetic biology lab she's built at home. You can find out more at jadenhastings.com. And that's all from us this week on Diffusion. Are you a scientist, artist, biohacker or maker who'd like to be interviewed about your work? Would your company like to sponsor Diffusion? Do you have a science outreach grant that I should apply for? Send your contributions, opinions, helpful suggestions and donations to science at diffusionradio.com. That's science at diffusionradio.com. Please like the Diffusion Science Radio page on Facebook and rate us on iTunes. Tell your friends. Follow me on Twitter at Ian Wolfe. The news music was Rhinos Theme by Kevin MacLeod on Incompetech.com. I produce Diffusion, which is broadcast around Australia to 28 stations on the community radio network, including 2RBM in the Blue Mountains of New South Wales, 8CCC in Alice Springs and Tennant Creek, 2MVR in Nambucca Valley, 3MVR in the Mallee Border Districts of Victoria and South Australia, City Park Radio 7LTN in Launceston, Tasmania, 2XXFM in Canberra, and my local station 2RDJ in Burwood, New South Wales. Diffusion is syndicated globally on the National Science Foundation's Science360 internet radio station and also on astronomy.fm. Subscribe to our podcast on the Diffusion website, www.diffusionradio.com. That's www.diffusionradio.com and check the website for links, photos and videos about this week's show. If you enjoyed the show, you can explore more than 950 previous episodes archived on diffusionradio.com where the shows are labelled by keywords so you can focus in on the stories you want to hear. Join my patrons at patreon.com slash diffusionradio or make a donation through paypal.me slash ianwolf. Subscribe to the Diffusion YouTube channel at youtube.com slash c slash diffusionradio. I'm Ian Wolf. Join us inside your audio device of choice for more science wondering next week on Diffusion Science Radio. Science is fun. It helps you to learn, to know, and to appreciate. When you study science, you may go on field trips. You discover the marvelous interrelationships between all living things. You learn to read the history of the Earth as it is written in rocks and fossils. You find out what makes things tick. Everything from a molecule to a living organism. In the study of science is found the most useful and satisfying knowledge of man. Knowledge of his physical world, its past, its present, and its future. And in your moments of relaxation, now and in the years to come, you will find the study of science leading you into fascinating pursuits. Photography. Collecting. Why study science? Study science because you will find in the study of science a richer, more rewarding life.